So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dana McClure, and I'm an environmental program specialist with the Department of Environmental Conservation's Office of Environmental Justice. Um, what I like people to know about me is that prior to working for the DEC, um, and I've only worked for the DEC for about five years, but prior to that, I worked for about 20 years um, in the nonprofit sector. In 15 of those, I did fundraising, grant writing, um, and special events. Um, so I'm in a really unique position that I've been on both sides now. Um, and I do like you guys to know that um, all the nonprofit groups know that I'm always advocating um, for um, you guys all the time. Um, I don't have much time today, so I just wanted to start by saying, um, you know, a little bit uh, br by briefly going over what environmental justice is and then talk about um, OEJ's Community Impact Grant Program the types of projects we fund, talk about some of our current projects. Um, and with that, uh, we will go ahead and get started. All right, um, so environmental justice efforts are designed to improve minority and low income communities that are facing disproportionate environmental impacts. Um, environmental justice itself um, is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, culture, national origin, income, educational levels, with respect to the development, um, the implementation and enforcement of protective environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, our office guides our work based on the principles that are reflected in the definitions of environmental justice and fair treatment in our environmental justice policy. Um, these are principles of participation and self-determination, um, that all people have the right to participate in decision-making processes um, and to cultural, economic, political, and environmental self-determination. Um, we want to also make sure that our policies and processes are based on mutual respect and justice, um, and that people have the right to safe environments where they live, work, and play. Um, and so hopefully, Emily was saying, and I don't have much time again today, so hopefully we'll get invited back to delve deeper into um, EJ in the future. Um, so the Office of Environmental Justice offers a few competitive grant opportunities, but our main grant program is our Community Impact Grant Program. Um, community Impact Grants provide community-based nonprofit organizations with funding for projects that address various environmental and public health concerns that disproportionately affect low-income and minority communities. Um, those environmental problems can be um, a wide range of things. It could be a large number of contaminated facilities, um, contaminated sites, noise, air, soil, water pollution, health problems, lack of green space, uh, and even lack of waterfront access. Um, for our community impact, Grants projects must address a community's exposure to multiple environmental harms and must also include a research component. Um, that research component can be primary or secondary to the project. Um, and so some groups will, you know, hire a research person. Others will just have, you know, a volunteer or an intern do some desk research. So it really just depends on what you need to have done. Um, that research component, though, need, must be um, used to expand the knowledge of the affected community. Uh, since its induction in 2006, uh, we have awarded, uh, the Office of Environmental Justice has awarded more than $12 million in community impact grants uh, to 214 projects statewide. Uh, last year in 2021, we awarded $3.1 million um, to 32 community-based organizations in six regions across the state. Uh, projects this past round include uh, water and air monitoring, increasing pollinator habitats, urban farming, community gardens, um, and projects that address how climate change is related to environmental and public health threats. 
Um, so some other things that you guys might want to know, uh, what are the grant award amounts? Uh, the minimum ask is for 50,000. The maximum is 100,000. Um, the participants will probably tell you that there is a lot of reporting required. Um, so it's quarterly, these grants are three year contracts. Um, so you would need to hand in a report quarterly. So that's about 12 um, reports. Um, so I highly recommend everybody asking for the $100,000 to uh, make it worth your time. Um, and I do know that, you know, sometimes $25,000 is uh, worth it, but there is uh, quite a bit of reporting requirements. So, um, you know, definitely think of that. Um, is there a list of all past awards? Yes, there is. If you're interested in seeing that, um, Emily, I sent her a bunch of links that she's going to send out to you all. Um, but if you're curious, you can always go to New York State's open data website at data.ny.com in search for environmental justice. Our grants will come back. Um, it's the year that they were awarded, the organization's name, the project description, what um, the project title was, what region they were. So there's a lot of good stuff there for you. Um, how do you know if you're located in a, a potential environmental justice area? Again, Emily's gonna send out some links um, for you, but there's a map on the DEC's Office of Environmental Justice website. Um, there's also the DEC Info Locator. If you just type that into Google, DEC Info Locator, um, there is a map um, for um, seeing the potential environmental justice areas. So I wanted to go in today and talk about some of our uh, grant um, participants that we've got. Um, first up, we've got the Sarah Laura Lawrence College, um, their Center for the Urban River at BZAC. Um, Sarah Lawrence serves as a fiscal sponsor for them. This project is titled the Yonkers Blue Team Tackling Local Water Quality Issues Through Research and Youth Engagement. Um, the 2019-2020 program included a four-day winter water academy training program for 20 Yonkers high school students. It included a trip to the Yonkers wastewater treatment plant. Uh, Ten of those students were hired for a paid summer internship, uh, which was called the Blue Team. They focused on monitoring fecal indica indicator bacteria in the Hudson. The goal was to determine the, uh, the severity of pollution um, and to get a sense of how long it takes for the Hudson to recover after a combined sewer overflow event. Um, and I think that Emily said Ryan was gonna be on this morning. So good morning, Ryan, if you're there. Um, his Cliff's note said that most of the time that the Hudson and Yonkers is swimmable by EPA standards uh, for fecal bacteria. And after a combined uh, sewer overflow event, the Hudson cleans itself very, fairly quickly. Um, the blue team did outreach about their research through articles, social media, um, and um, they were able to get this information out um, to groups in their community. Um, then they came back in in 2021 um, and were awarded $100,000 for their project titled Rising Tides, Training Innovative and Diverse Environmental Scientists and QPCR Research Program. The new grant is very similar. It's the same Water Academy. They hired back uh, 10 of the Blue Team members and also two past Blue Team graduates for tiered mentorship. Um, the Blue Team continued monitoring fecal indicator bacteria in the Hudson. They also added group lessons and activities, including communications training and resume building workshop with the help from Sarah Lawrence Communications and Com Career, Service, Career Services Department. Um, they also helped students organize a community outreach event that drew around 150 people that day. Um, they, since this is a new project, as I said, they had to come up with a new research component. So it can't be a continuation of an old research component. We do require new research components. So this one, they turned over their attention to the Sawmill River. Um, so that is all great. Um, 
what Ryan wants you to know. Um, so I did talk to Ryan and I did talk to uh, my person at uh, Rocking the Boat, which is going to be my next slide. Um, he understands that watershed groups struggle with both community engagement and more advanced research. So Ryan wanted me to stress that community impact grants can do things like pay for youth interns or pay for equipment. Um, and or faculty or consultant partners to conduct more advanced research on your waterways. Um, and he really felt that it was important to, for you to know that the grants are large enough to do a really thorough project as opposed to stringing a whole bunch of uh, small grants together. Um, so I, I, I think that's really important. The other thing I gave to Emily um, for you guys is our last request for applications. Um, you can look that over. We try to go out annually with our community impact grants. We have not done that yet this year. We have been focused on um, another grant program. Um, we're hopeful to release another community impact grant either by the end of this year or early next year. Um, so you could review that RFA. Um, and see all of the eligibility requirements. And there are a lot of eligibility requirements for the community impact grants. Um, so I would highly recommend that you or your development person print that out and really go through page by page and highlight you know, all the important things that um, you need to know and really make sure that you're eligible. Um, there's nothing worse for me um, than having to... Um, you know, make somebody not eligible because um, they weren't in an environmental justice area or they didn't, you know, um, read um, everything right. So please, please make sure that, you know, um, you read those RFAs good. Um, this next grant here is for Rocking the Boat. In 2018, Rocking the Boat was funded for their project measuring Bronx River water quality and pathogen levels um, with the goal of involving approximately 400 South Bronx youth in a water quality monitoring project of the Bronx River. Um, this is an educational and training program where they want to show the youth the process of how to obtain the samples and then complete the water testing in their lab. Um, what I felt was great about this project, um, as you can imagine, COVID put a kink in many of our groups programming. Um, some, you know, we work with really small organizations. Um, some we work with are larger, but many of the groups were not able to complete their projects or had to stop completely. Um, and I kind of like to mention Rocking the Boat because I feel they didn't miss a beat. Um, while the remote programming could not fully replicate the experience of being out on the Bronx River, the redesign lessons were still exploring the program's curriculum of ecosystems, urban waterways, and human impact. Um, direct monitoring and data collection on the program's uh, slate of research projects also could not continue um, remotely. However, the background education related to each project did take place on lesson days. Um, I think they said that they had two lesson days a week and the video conferencing platform. So they were doing things in person. They switched to doing everything online which allowed guest speakers from partner organizations um, to actually talk with the participants. So, um, you know, while there was setbacks of COVID, there's also positive things um, about going digital and having Zoom or WebExes. Um, and uh, so that was a good thing. They were really worried that the youth would lose interest or forget their skills, but they were really happy to report that working virtually energized the youth into looking in their own backyards. And when they started back in person, they didn't miss a beat and picked up right where they left off. Um, so again, um, I talked to the project manager for this project and you know, he felt that it's really important um, that water quality is a part of so many other concepts and projects that students work on, that water quality testing is a great way to introduce students to a scientific study um, of the water with simple introductory tests that touch on so many important concepts. Um, 
and then they can build on that. So um, what they went back for after was pathogen testing and microplastic testing um, and more advanced tests for advanced students that have already been in the program for two years. So we're talking juniors and seniors in high school. Um, so the great news about this project, so their goal was to reach 400 students um, and they reached over 700 Bronx middle and high school students um, during their funded projects. Um, they were just funded for another program for seaweed farm bio extraction and fertilizer um, for youth and community education on the Bronx River. I'm really excited to work with them again on this project. I'm sure it will be fantastic, um, just like all of our groups. Um, but so I, those are the things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, I don't want to share too much on Oakdale Lake. I'm going to let them talk about it, but it is a fantastic project. I'm sure that they'll discuss it. Um, but for me, one of the great things about Oakdale Lake is all of the partnerships they formed. So, you, you know, you can't just work on, um, uh, a lake without getting municipality endorsement. They have that. Um, and also they have a fiscal sponsor in the Columbia uh, Land Conservancy. And then they also have partnered with a wonderful um, ecology group in Great Ecology. So I kind of feel like that project is very unique um, in its own right, um, but it also showcases what you can do with having fantastic partners. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I am happy to answer any questions at the end. The EJ Community Impact Grant Program. I put the links that Dana mentioned into the chat and I'll also be sending those around in an email afterwards. So don't worry about clicking everything right now. You'll have it in your inbox after the program. Uh, so next I'd like to introduce Tamar Adler from Friends of Oaktail Lake to talk a little bit more about their project. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dana, for that great tee up and that great view of the other amazing projects that are happening. It's so exciting. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, great. So this, this map is actually a product of our first um, EJ Community Impact Grant, because until we began this project, we did not have a watershed map of Oakdale Lake. So I started with this um, to show you where Oakdale Lake is in the city of Hudson, but also to sort of show how elemental um, some of the work that we've done has been, uh, that lake has been around for around a hundred years, um, we've never known what the watershed was before. As you can see, it's right in downtown Hudson, um, and it's you know surrounded by by a city. This is the lake that we work with. It's the lake that our kids swim in, and it is the lake that holds the free summer camp in Hudson. Um, when back in twenty eighteen which is when my son was two and all of his friends were two, uh, I started going to Oakdale and realized that it was um, really incredible and really under-resourced. And um, a bunch of other parents and I got together and um, we raised $10,000 and approached the uh, Columbia University's School of Architecture planning and preservation and um, started a community visioning project, which used input from our whole community over a series of meetings to come up with a new vision for Oakdale Lake. Um, because at that point, very little money was going into it. There was that very rarely would there be um, uh, lifeguards other than annual testing for um, uh, fecal coliform and one other thing that had to be tested for summer camp use. We had no idea what was 
in the water, there would be these like algal blooms and uh, just who knows, who knew if they were dangerous or not dangerous. Um, there was a lot of garbage on the trail. There's a half mile trail around the lake. Um, and in general, the, 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 the infrastructure was really neglected and the city didn't use it other than for this free summer camp. And the kids who went to the free summer camp were getting kind of a raw deal because um, the water seemed, you know, there would be this big kind of weird blooms and it seemed sort of dirty. And there were all kinds of crazy theories about like what was under the water. And people would say it was like built on cement blocks and just nobody, nobody knew um, very much of anything. And no one knew where the water came from. So this, you know, all of that spurred us to to uh, fundraise and we were just a kind of loose group of parents and um, I'll just flip through now the end product of this first community visioning um, project that we did. It was this really amazing design concept for re-envisioning the lake, taking into account all of the input that the community gave us. And I'll stop for one moment on this one, which is clear water. Um, we, we ended up with eight ideas, sort of eight areas that could be worked on. Uh, and as you can see from this, you know, a way of clearing the water, aerating the water. We didn't know exactly what it was gonna be, but you could see falling leaves. We sort of theorized that the number, the amount of organic matter that fell into the lake was causing some of the, um, that maybe it was nutrient loading and that was causing some of the kind of fuzziness in the water. Um, and then the rest of these are just, you know, other ideas for re-envisioning the lake. Um, this is my son, the year we started Friends of Oakdale Lake. Um, and it was a day when it was raining. And I, I mentioned before we started this, um, this webinar that the, the day that this picture was taken, he had, um, he was really excited about what he called swim diving, where he would just like throw his whole body into the water and he uh, threw his whole body into the water right by right at the beach. And he came up with a um, fish hook stuck into his, <laughs> into his swimsuit. And that was sort of one of those indications that we really did want to make sure we could start um, focusing attention and love and resources on this lake. Um, uh, and this is sort of some of the stuff that we would see. And we ended up focusing on number four, clear water, um, as our first real area of concern because um, it affected and affects the most beings. You know, it affects everything living in the water. It affects everyone swimming in the water. And um, more than half of the kids using our summer camp live um, at or below the poverty line. Um, I think more than 70% of the kids in our school system get free or reduced school lunch. Um, essentially, you know, this is the outdoor and swimming place for the majority of the kids in our, in our community. Um, and we just didn't know what why the water looked like this and what it was that made it look like this. Um, and so this was sort of like in the larger hierarchy of things that mattered, this seemed like one that we could turn our attention to immediately. Um, and as Dana pointed out, we also have these incredible partnerships, um, particularly with Columbia Land Conservancy and Rebecca Walker, who I think is on this, call um, was the one who sent us the, the EJ grant and said, hey, you know, she and the Columbia Land Conservancy had been following our work through the design consent process. And she said, hey, this seems like this seems like something you guys could could potentially get and work on this. Um, these are just more Oakdale glamour photos. So one of the things that made it possible for us to start working on water quality was that we had been doing this by hand without information for a few years. Um, that's my husband and I don't know, somebody else. And 
this is um oops uh and this is peter frank who's um maybe not on this call but he's the head of an amazing organization called friends of hudson youth with whom we also partner on lots of stuff these are other people and we before we um probably after we had applied for this grant but before we had received it we we would just go in to and just pull pull stuff out and hope that we were pulling out the right stuff and just try to get the water in shape. This is, I now know, um, an invasive subaquatic uh, species called curly leaf pondweed. This over here um, is Phragmites, which is uh, another, well, it, it whether or not it has to be removed is, is debated, but um, we were doing it by hand and without a lot of information. And so we applied for a grant that was incredibly kind of ambitious uh, and, and wide reaching. And I'm shocked that we have actually managed to get it done, but it was um, to, first of all, map the watershed of Oakdale Lake. Um, second, create a protocol for testing the water in Oakdale at regular intervals um, over the course of a number of seasons, uh, and in particular after storm events, and train citizen scientists, so community members, to do the testing, and then have the samples, the water samples, sent to a lab, and then input all of the information into this kind of complex water quality monitoring um, program called Aquatox, which would then predict changes in the water quality and changes in nutrient levels and dissolved oxygen and stuff like that over the course of several years. And then to continue to do the testing over the next, the whole period of the grants so over the next two years to see how accurate the model was, meaning like, can we go on using this model? Is this a useful predictive tool for what is happening in our lake. Um, and then to put all of this to go on, you know, to go on doing doing the testing with community members so that it was never really like top down um, and, and as many places as possible to involve kids. So we did um, also a benthic macro invertebrate um, identification workshop with little kids because little kids can like pick stuff out of the water and compare it to pictures. Um, and then uh, at the end of it, have a full real understanding of the watershed, the water quality in Oakdale, and a set of clear recommendations, short-term and long-term for improving the water, which is why it's called, the project is called OWAWA, which is fun to say, but, um, was Oakdale Watershed Assessment and Watershed Amelioration Project. So it was kind of a biggie, but um, uh, but we did it. And, you know, like all the other projects, we were sort of dealing with this during the, the dog days of COVID, but luckily it was a just an outdoor project. This is Kate Collinson, who uh, was the lead ecologist on this project. Um, with great ecology and is now actually we, this is kind of a spoiler, but um, we received a second EJ grant to implement the recommended amelioration procedures. And Kate is now our project manager for this next one because she's no longer with great ecology. Um, so she knows the lake really well, but this was our first training. There's me and my son, who no longer has a fish hook in him there, learning how to, um, I think this is the, the chamomile bottle, learning how to drop a bottle, of, a, a glass bottle into water, into the lake and fill it with water to be removed for sampling. And um, I thought I saw Pammy Price on this call. This is Pammy, who was an inveterate volunteer and is always, always involved in anything that we do to work on Oakdale and there's Dylan. Um, and it was like, this was just the first time that we ever got any of this information. This is a Secchi disc, um, which is actually like a really beautifully elegant, simple way of measuring water clarity or turbidity. And we, for the first time, put in a, um, a depth ruler 
you know, just to know how deep it was. Um, oh, there was another part of this that I didn't mention and I realized I forgot to put pictures in, but we, one of our first in the sort of reconnaissance, just taking the lie of the land stage of this project, we did a bathymetric study of the lake, which was one of the most informative things we could have done because we just didn't know what the bottom looked like. So we found out the whole the whole contour of the, it's a four and a half acre lake, no, it's five acre lake. So we got five acres of contour and um, were able to really see where it was deepest or it was shallowest, what, um, yeah, just everything, all the information. Um, I'm kind of fast forwarding uh, to the conclusion because we continued to do, you know, it, it's was a sort of iterative um, project and that we continued to do the same things over the course of the, the grant term. Um, and we ended up with this really clear picture, um, series of pictures, figurative picture of the lake health and what could be done and how it could be done. And um, it was it was presented in the form of these beautiful posters, these really easy to read graphics, which was um, up in an exhibit at the public library where you know every everybody goes and there's tons of programming. Um, we learned that the lake is moderately eutrophic um, and, and and intervention is needed. Um, that the nutrient of concern is phosphorus, the nitrogen level is fine. We learned that the only um, mineral of concern is copper a mineral? It's an element. Anyway, the only like, but we were worried about heavy metals in the substrate, um, particularly because uh, there was conversation about potentially dredging in the future and learned that copper is the only um, heavy metal of concern, which is, you know, stinks that there's copper, but great that there isn't lead and um, just the stuff that you really need to know if all of your, you know, if all of the kids are going to be swimming there um, and, and the parents too. So this exhibit was great. We worked for a long time on um, really easy to understand graphics. Um, this one explains how eutrophication works, which was super helpful to me. I stopped taking science in the 10th grade. So this was great. Um, and um, we, uh, we had this great presentation by um, the, by the person who was the project manager at that point, Dave Yazzo, who explains everything um, really nicely. This is the Aquatox model, which I was talking about. And this presentation accompanied the, um, the poster exhibit. Um, there were lots of questions. Everyone was in mass. Oh yeah, this was really a, one of the many beautiful um, graphics, uh, and this is the the watershed of the lake, but also showing the unconfined aquifer um, underlaid within it, and then getting a cross section of that. I thought this was one of the the best um, graphics that we got. And one of the things we learned, which you can see from these three dots over here, these three um, yellow dots, is that uh, I think there's also one over here. There were a bunch of um, we found a few uh, inlets, like sewer, not, not necessarily sewer pipes, but like um, pipes that we don't know where the water's coming from that do um, release out into the lake. And so one of the sort of ancillary things that we might be able to do with a with city partnership is do a dye test to figure out where the water is coming from. But it was just, you know, it was kind of like, three years of getting constant, amazing, useful information. Um, one of the things that we learned was that curly leaf pondweed is a leading source of phosphorus in our lake. It blooms, it is invasive, meaning it cannot be regulated inside of the water ecosystem by other plants or animals. Um, and it blooms in late May flowers like crazy and then senesces, which is a water scientific term. I mean, it's a, it's a word in English, but um, they use it to, to mean when it starts to die down and you wanna 
apparently harvest it before it begins to die down when it's when it's flowering. Um, and by doing this over the course of years, we were able to really pinpoint um, when when that is every year because we have pictures from before we got the grant and we were just going out in canoes and pulling stuff and then um, pictures during the grant where you know the, the volunteers would go out and, and take pictures and write down their visual observations of stuff. Um, one of the recommendations in Great Ecology's final report and in that presentation was that we professionally harvest this invasive subaquatic species because it doesn't all it does is contribute phosphorus, which is one of the, the nutrients of concern. And uh, lo and behold, we, this is already getting into the next, our next grant cycle, but we, because we had um, recommendations from Great Ecology based on, at that point, I think we had two or two and a half years of data. They were confident giving us clear amelioration recommendations and a proposal for another grant um, for actually putting into effect everything that they uh, thought we should do to help the lake ecology. Um, and those uh, recommendations were just very straightforward and they, inc they included continuing with citizen science water quality monitoring with a slightly revised protocol, um, which we haven't been able to get into effect this summer, but we'll be starting that next spring. Um, and uh, again, a benthic invertebrate, you know, starting sort of base level and then doing it repeatedly. Um, and really excitedly, excitingly um, professionally harvesting the invasive subaquatic vegetation, the pondweed, um, and also putting in solar aeration and um, for research, we're actually gonna be looking at, um, we're, we're gonna be working with Hudson uh, Public School students and looking at how the application of barley grass can work to pull phosphorus out of the water. We're gonna wait on that until next summer as well. Everything kind of happened a little bit quickly this summer, but one of the things that we're able to do was hire this incredibly um, careful professional weed harvester who brought his weedo which is this like water tractor in and oh that was the after um and spent a full day harvesting the the invasive weeds and then he also came back the following day and took down there was a lot of overhanging um branches a lot of a lot of leaves were falling into the lake that really didn't didn't need to be. And also, you know, if we're trying to pull out heavy nutrients, we're trying to stop nutrient loading, um, keeping that from happening every year was a really hard, hard, big priority. So he came back the following day and um, without disturbing any of the like turtle habitat or any kind of beloved, you know, hardwood that was in the water as habitat, he would, he did cut off overhanging um, branches to again, all in the service of mitigating um, nutrient loading. And then this is actually what, I mean, this is a slightly deceiving in that the, there are periods we've learned of like late high vegetation growth and then die out. Um, so this is not all due to the harvesting and, and, and careful work that was done, but um, it looks pretty great. And it, I think it still looks pretty great. So this is right before camp started this year. Um, and oh, I don't know what that's doing there, but um, this slide is just to show that, you know, it was everything that we are doing is not something that we are doing alone. Um, but we couldn't, I mean, to what Dana said about uh, reporting, Piper Alf did all of the um, report writing for our first grant cycle, Rebecca Walker, is like from Columbia Land Conservancy is our, I don't, I don't even know. She's like our, our guru, our Swami, our priestess. She helps us with everything. She keeps us on task and we couldn't do it without her. Um, the DEC has obviously funded this and, and answered every question and been an, uh, just an incredible partner and great ecology, um, you know, who we've done all this work with have really invested in, in 
the place itself and have at various times, you know, driven up, not as part of like any agreement that we had or the statement of work, but just said like, oh, you know what, I just want to walk around myself after this um, storm event and see what it looks like and see what's coming out of where. Maybe I'll just do a little testing myself. Um, and I think all of that together has created just a sort of extraordinary um, uh, increase in the knowledge base that we have over, you know, just a few years, um, which is great. It's really incredible to hear about how Friends of Oakdale Lake emerged as a group of concerned parents and, and how you've been able to build capacity and work with these partners and get not only one, but two grants to plan and implement some of these practices to improve the lake. So um, congratulations and, and thank you so much for, for sharing the project this morning. So we're now going to open it up to questions. So if you have questions on the environmental justice community impact grants uh, for Dana, maybe from more of the grant management side, or if there are certain requirements that you have questions about, um, please feel free to ask those questions. If you've got questions about some of the specifics, um, we've got Tamar and, and Piper off here as well to answer some of those questions. So um, we've just got a comment from Pammy Price, who is here in the Zoom room with us, that the partnerships, community engagement, and investment in all of the volunteers is amazing at Oakdale, and she's so happy to be part of it. Great. So uh, we've got a question on, uh, two questions about lakes. So what is the maximum depth of Oakdale Lake? And then in terms of the environmental justice grants, can private lakes apply for that funding? Our maximum de depth is 19 feet. Okay, so in terms of the grant, again, um, be sure that you look at the RFA that Emily sent around. So the most important thing that you need to kind of make sure is that um, it, you're a community-based nonprofit organization in an environmental justice area. So if your lake is not in, you know, one of those areas, um, you know, you would really need to justify um, and talk about how people that were in an adjacent um, environmental justice area uh, benefits from whatever you were doing at the lake or anything like that. Um, so private lakes, you would need to basically find a nonprofit group to partner with um, to do something like this. And again, Oakdale Lakes project um, kind of shows you um, a way to go about doing that. Um, you know, they, again, they had the fiscal sponsor with the Columbia Land Conservancy um, and they just had a, a, a fantastic strong project. Um, so, you would need to, again, look over the RFA and make sure that your organization that's applying, um, you know, would be eligible to apply for that grant. Follow up on that too. So in terms of the, um, the very community-based organization that would be an eligible applicant for this. You know, many of our watershed groups might include more than one municipality because the watershed crosses municipal lines, um, but obviously they would need to have a, a real clear focus in one particular community that is that environmental justice community. Could you speak a little bit to the eligibility of, of watershed groups? Um, again, so this grant in particular, um, I think there's something like 15 eligibility requirements. Um, so it's, you know, um, really hard to, you know, say, oh, well, this would be, you know, particular, you know, this lake straddles this county and that county, um, you know, so you'd kind of have to really plan it out um, and kind of go from there. Unfortunately, I can't really... I would have to wait and see, you know, if somebody was to call me about a very specific, um, you know, 
thought or whatnot. Um, I can't ever speak on very specific projects because of the competitive nature of the grant, but I can answer eligibility questions and try to guide you the best that I can um, within the frame of the RFA. Um, so if you guys do read over the RFA and have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email should be in the RFA. Um, Emily can also provide it. We can kind of discuss. I'm happy to jump on a call. Um, we use WebEx. I'm happy to jump on one of those to kind of go over things more. Um, and then the other thing too is, you know, I encourage groups to get a hold of the other groups as well, you know. Um, what did you feel was the process? You know, um, I know that our grant process, um, it takes a lot of time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Tamara and Piper could, you know, uh, chime in with that. It's not an easy application. It's not like, you know, you're, you know, something you've really got to put your thoughts together and answer the questions well. It's highly competitive. Um, we usually have 40, 50 groups applying. Sometimes we have enough funding for, uh, you know, all the groups and a lot, and, you know, sometimes we don't, um, you know, so there's just so much that goes into the community impact grants and, and again, um, eligibility. Great. So it's really hard to say. Thank you. A uh, question for Tamar, if you were going to give a piece of advice to a group that's just getting started with this, now that you've gone through a couple grant cycles here, um, do you have like a, your one piece of advice for groups that are just getting underway and are interested in getting started with the EJ grant application? Um, I, I would have a, I have a few, I think. One would be um, I, that making sure you're not doing it alone and having, if you are, I mean, I'm a food writer by profession. So um, jumping into a really, uh, really sort of extensive application and reporting process would not have been feasible for me alone. Um, if you have a great nonprofit background and you've done all this stuff, then maybe this doesn't apply. But for me, um, having Piper, who is a project manager by profession, and so who like does this all the time and keeps everybody on track and and really finds like the loopholes and reminds everybody, you know, that well, task one actually wasn't completed, um, won't be completed until you've created like eight graphics, which like I did, that's not how, how my mind works. And then um, like, and, and Rebecca, I felt like, you know, Piper, Rebecca and, um, and Kate and Dave, the, the great ecology folks and I were like, and, and remain this, this team where like we each have our strengths and we, and together we can actually make the thing happen. But I would say making sure you have a, a team like that. I mean, I think Rebecca might've even like figured out at some point that she had to make the deadlines for everything like a couple of weeks earlier. This is what my book editor does too. Like just tell us the wrong date so that we have, so that we get it done. But you know, like knowing that Rebecca, knowing that Piper wasn't going to let anything fall through like a loophole and everything was going to get, you know, paid for by the right person and the tasks were going to get accomplished. And then Rebecca was not going to let anything come in late and was going to make sure that all of the um, remuneration happened on the right schedule and that um, made it, made it all doable. So I would say um, not, not ambitiously going into it without a great team. Um, and then the only other thing is, you know, like it can be, it can be really, I think we are constantly facing, you know, our limited capacity. And we've luckily learned that we're really focused on, you know, getting this, that this particular, these water um, sort of markers are really clear. And this is, these projects are all very, very clear to, to accomplish, to figure out the success, you know, to gauge the success of and stuff like that. But um, with all of this work, just making sure you actually have enough capacity to um, do the project, you know, in a, in a, in a responsible and great way is what I would say. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I've got a question here with an acronym that I'm not sure what it means, but maybe Dana will know. So um, with the Growing Stems Foundation in Poughkeepsie, New York, through education, can youth leave the confines of the DAC to gain experiential knowledge? Is that disadvantaged community DAC? So I'm thinking that's what they're talking about um, is the DAC community. So that's the disadvantaged communities. Um, so the disadvantaged communities are a little bit different than environmental justice areas. Um, there's a lot of overlap there, um, but environmental justice areas were based on uh, census tract information. Um, and so there's thresholds for those, which you can find on our website. Um, the disadvantaged communities on top of that also has um, 45, I want to say, climate indicators. Um, so it is a little bit different. Um, and so um, when you're applying for the environmental justice grants, you would be looking at the environmental justice map, not the DAC maps. Um, again, most of them overlap. Um, but you definitely would need to make sure that you're in a potential environmental justice area, or if you're just outside one, again, you would need to make your case that, yes, we're not in an environmental justice area, um, but our entire service area is in this environmental justice area um, and kind of write about that in your um, narrative. Great, thank you. Um, Tamar, is the Friends of Oakdale Lake in the New York State Federation of Lake Associations? Uh, no, but I don't know why. I mean, maybe because I haven't done what has to be done to join the Federation of Lake Associations, but I, if it, I, I, I will if it seems like a good thing. Great, we've, we've got a comment from Andrew Lawrence from Friends of Walton Lake in Orange County, uh, encouraging lakes to, to join the New York State Federation of Lake Associations. I believe that there's support and technical assistance available through that uh, lake association group. Um, and also a note on, on some of the hand harvesting of these invasive species and a need for more tributary and lake adjacent folks to get involved. And I completely agree. I hope that um, by sharing information about the EJ grant program and about Oakdale Lake, uh, we can inspire more folks to apply for these grants and think about how your water or watershed pr projects might fit into this uh, this framework, this context to get some of this work done. I think some of the advantages of the EJ grant is that just echoing what some of Ryan Palmer mentioned in his remarks is that um, not only is it a larger pot of money that um, and some of our other other grant programs, but also that there is a, a cash advance, so it's not strictly reimbursement, which makes it a little bit easier for some of the lower capacity groups that can really struggle with um, reimbursement based grants that it, it makes it a little bit more accessible as well. So the, there's really some structure built into this grant program to really meet meet groups where you're at and help you be as successful as as possible in, in implementing some of these projects that are that are so needed in our communities. So with that, I'm going to close our breakfast webinar. Uh, and thank you so much again for joining us. Hope to see you on Thursday, October 13th for the next in the series, which will focus on Climate Smart Communities grants. Um, and we hope to see you at the annual watershed conference as well. Wouldn't be a webinar without the cat. She's right on. Cue. Right on cue, just like you said. <laughs> so thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful day.